orangutan. I thought that was kind of impolite. <laughs> it's just, yeah, he was saying something like how he's the only one who really loves you and blah, blah, blah. And he says, well, I didn't mend him orangutan or whatever. He calls me an orangutan. I just, man, what the fuck was that shit? Species is on. I don't think that is salty. Orangutans are cute, actually. Well, I think he probably was implying a big smelly orangutan. But yes, they are. They have a good look. I mean, yo, know, when they have the full... Well, I'm sure he meant it as an insult, but it's not really. <laughs> they are cute. Oh, I think Frank and Hitler would be better. I don't really go for the vampire thing. Vampires are kind of boring, in my opinion. Opinion. You're kind of boring. You just need like a big, just need like a big. Kind of boring. Well, whatever. You just get like a big fly swatter. They're just nothing more than fucking. They're barely insects. Vampires. Come on. It's not a kick-ass monster. I like vampires because they have pizzazz and they're rich and they have castles and they're. They got bitches. Oh, and they're Money. faggoty. That's why you like them, is they're faggoty. They're always faggoty. Yeah, cool yeah. and faggoty. What's wrong with that? Yeah, long fingernails and faggoty, faggoties. <laughs> yeah, whatever. <laughs> yeah, you're into that. Lazy, faggoty vampires. Obese cats. Yeah, that cat really is uh, so much cuter than you deserve. By the way, this movie I want to review, Inception, uh, the guy who made uh, <clears throat> the Dark Knight, Batman, the Dark Knight movie made this one too. He's the writer and director for this one. I know how much you love Dark Knight. Yeah, so it's just gonna have to be filmed in Darko Vision. Yeah, you know, and uh, yeah, be no plot, and uh, all the um, physical chase scenes will be preposterously impossible. Yeah, well, all movies, so they're all they're too many plot flaws in too many movies. All over the place. Actually, I really liked this one. It's about. Uh, dreams and people who can manage to get inside other people's dreams and steal their ideas or maybe even plant new ideas but it's not really those people's dreams they're building the dreams for them they even have an architect to build the dreams and the entire movie is interesting but I really like this uh, this you know time being relative thing they did there because in the dream time goes slower. The deeper you go into the dream, the slower the time goes compared to, to the real life. And it's actually, I mean, you know, like when you dream for 15 minutes and you wake up and it seems like you dreamed for hours, they applied this concept. And it's, I don't know, the entire movie just blew me away from the idea to the execution and everything. I loved it. Yeah, well, it's not a good sign, but we'll see. <laughs> Eventually I'll see. Eventually, uh, but uh, yeah, that whole dream, the whole sp sped up life experience thing is sort of interesting. Just living at the hummingbird pace or something, you know, it's like, you know, what's what's life like at a, you know, if you're, you know, there's a Star Trek episode that does that, so that does that, you know, like where they're Kelvins or whatever they are, and you know, they end up being invisible because, you know, their speed has changed so dramatically, you know, that everybody looks like they're just standing still from the fast perspective and from the other perspective, people are moving so fast nobody could see them. 
but it didn't make any sense because the time didn't add up. <laughs> you know, because it would, if you really did it as, as if it practically happened, you know, you couldn't do it in an hour-long Star Trek episode. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I mean, it's just that idea that we might be able to enrich our experience, you know, if we could increase the clock speed of our brains. You know, one day could be a month kind of thing in perception. Ah, Pyro, it's got a hand up, apparently. All right, go ahead, say something stupid about, he was talking. Hey, I'm sorry I left, I ran out on the will, but my, uh, my daughter came up and wanted to tell me some emotional stuff, and so I had a hard to hard with her, but, uh, so I'm not really sorry, but anyway, that's why I left. I am sorry that I just ditched out, but she was, she was upset. So anyway, um, no, I had a different question. I was curious, uh, and this might be something that would bore everybody else, but I figure you at least would have an opinion, so we could keep it short or long, whatever you want, of course. But uh, publicly financed um, campaigns, I mean, do you support publicly financed campaigns? What do you think about public financing? Uh, it's directed at me, is it? Um, yeah, well, I just, I just don't see the point in it, you know. I mean, it's, it's a zero-sum game. I think we need, all we need is the technology. I mean, I think having rules that oblige politicians to actually publish something and actually maybe make YouTube videos or, you know what I mean, have a competition, like have the arena so fair, like if they don't show up for the debate or they don't, you know what I mean, all that stuff should be almost like a given. Like other candidates should be able to, they should almost be forced, okay? Like, like, like there would be a thing that says, okay, you're forced to go on YouTube, you're forced to go into stick cam or something, be part of a debate, just to see how they can hold up and, and force that to be the test. But this idea of 30-second commercials, I'm against it in the first place. I don't, want, I, don't want a, I don't want them to exist in the first place. I certainly don't want government money used to subsidize them because I think they're completely corrosive to any kind of rational politics. You don't learn anything about anybody in 30-second commercials. You know, putting their kids and their wife and their dog in a commercial and saying, I'm a great guy. Who the, how, that, how the fuck does that do anybody any good? I agree with that. I mean, okay, so I have an ulterior thing going on. I'm working on this uh, political campaign for a county person, and we just got, a couple of years ago, I was working on a local thing to help uh, some people that were really accomplishing getting public financing at the county level, and we're in a pilot program in, uh, in, in our county for four years, so two elections to do this. And, you know, it's funny because we often think of the campaign you know, at the federal level with these companies that can afford Lear jets and the fly around the world. You know, the county level, these guys are beholden to some guy that owns three 7-Elevens or something, the guy that owns the local newspaper, just for a couple thousand dollars. So I think at the county level, I used to have mixed feelings about public financing, why I've helped them do that bullshit they do. But I think at the county level especially, um, so, um, so so, yeah, and we're in the district where there's one guy to get a job that pays, how much does, Jen, how much does that pay a year, the county council? Oh, it's like 35000 35000 He like paid $70,000 to get that shit job. Now, because he did that, he beat his four-time opponent, I'm almost done, that paid $10,000. Uh, the public financing is 40000 So we're uh, managing, or I'm, I'm just supporting, but people that, people are managing, we're working on this campaign that's going to have this public finance. Yeah, well, see, if they did something with the money, then I'd say, okay, but yeah, you know what they do here? They just, they just buy signs, okay, and so they have a sign war. Even when they're not running against somebody, they'll put up their signs, you know, thousands of signs everywhere. And it's just about, like, who's got the bigger font or the squarest font or whose name looks best in blue or red. And it's, you don't know anything about who these fuckers are. All you know is, oh, yeah, that's the red sign guy. It's a big battle of signs, and we've had a bunch of battle of signs so far. And, in fact, one of the guys that partnered in to, to operate this campaign just got fired kind of over strange sign stuff. And really, you have to do the signs. And here in Hawaii, you actually also have to wave. Politicians, even the governor, stand on the side of the road and wave. You have to do that, which is stupid, because it doesn't really get you votes. But it's like, if you don't do it, 
it'd be bad in the paper, it's a tradition and that kind of bullshit. But I know we would like to do, I'd like to do some things where we give back to the community, you know, build, uh, you know, res the self-serve, you know, rescue tube stations for, that they have on Kauai now because of so many drownings where there's no lifeguards or, or clean a park or we don't have enough money. I mean, I think these guys would spend 40 million. I don't understand why they don't, you know, open a library. It's just crazy because they spend it on signs. They spend it on signs. Okay, TV signs. You know, th those 30 second spots are just a way to blow freaking $200,000 on a sign. And they don't do anything else. And, and fine, when you're an activist and all you can afford is a sign and you have your kid paying on it, okay. But I mean, you got $100 million and all you can think of to do is a bigger and bigger sign and have people know your name and never say anything. Yeah, I agree. That, and uh, the signs are a pain too because it's a lot of effort and there's a certain amount of if people don't see them, then they won't vote, you know, but it's really not the most important thing. The most important thing is actually talking to voters and getting them to go vote, like on election day. Yeah, what would you do, Gary, if you, I mean, it's a ridiculous amount of money. Most of the people on this island where we're having this county program, they get three, four thousand um, dollars. One's getting seven fifty, but this guy, because he's pro-development, spent seventy thousand dollars. So this one, so we're going to spend money on radio and stuff, but I don't know if if you have ideas of how what people should do, because we want to run it as a good example. Yeah, well, it's hard, you know, when you got to play on the battle on the on playing field that exists, you know, and that that it is just this name recognition thing because there people don't have any, they don't they're not accustomed to doing it any other way, and it's sort of an infrastructure thing. It's like here, like you know, I've sort of got a website, you know, inmendum.com is was a local website, you know, and that's how it all started for me. You know, and so, um, you know, but the idea was is having a message board and getting, you know, causing some some controversy and getting some stuff happening. So if you have a, if you start to build a platform that's separate from government, you know what I mean? But, but yeah, I mean, it's a place where at least there can be a conversation. Maybe people can get a little bit more interested in the local politics, the local issues, and actually know what people stand for instead of just voting based on who has the best haircut. And, you know, but yeah, I mean, obviously to win, it's about name recognition and it's about party affiliation and all that other crap. And so, yeah, I don't have any suggestions for how to play the shitty game the right way. I just suggest that we should try to force candidates into a better arena. So we should try to create mechanisms, subsidize mechanisms, even if we're going to spend the money, we should spend them, we should pay them to show up at debate a Rama or something, you know, or do whatever we have to do, make it such a a thing that everybody wants to show up, you know what I mean? It's like make it, put broadcast it on all the networks or do whatever you have to do, you know, to force people to want to be there or they're going to lose out. But force the confrontation so people can see the difference between these people and try to create enough public interest in it you know, to get people to show up and watch it. You could have a C-SPAN kind of channel where people put up their debates and arguments and stuff and have more of a, you know, and not have to have it cost a hundred million dollars either. You know, there's ways to let people have media access and, um, uh, you know, and you could have systems, if you did do it online, you could even have systems where assuming you start with this crazy number of candidates, you know, you get, you know, you get time and space proportional to the number of supporters you have so far. So by the time you got to the end, you know, it'd be the top four people, but everybody would have had a chance to be those four people. Yeah, I think it should be even more open than that. I don't like going by some sort of, you know, how many signatures do you have kind of bullshit, because that can narrow you know, it can close people out of arguments too soon, too quickly. Um, but there's, yeah, there needs to be a better mechanism. She's not going to close her mouth. She'll have to go. Um, anyway, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, just making it a, it's making it a, sh a better show, and they've never tried to really do that. They've, debates have gotten better, but they're still pretty stale. You know, these orchestrated candidates decide on the rules. You know, you can't let the candidates make the rules. Hi, Ro. How much well, money? Well, so, so anyway, the thing is, it's kind of interesting. Um, 